Hi, welcome to the Book Fest Spring 2023. This panel, or actually really more of a conversation, is with uh, is, is called Running Wild with Lisa Diane Kastner. And um, we probably will wander all over the place. Now, Lisa is the founder and executive direct editor of Running Wild Press and Rise Press, who believes uh, we can change the world through story. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Jonathan. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm taking a nice little pause here to chat with you. And before I go back to writing a gazillion words again. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Seriously. I know your calendar is insane. So. <laughs> yeah, like that, but, you know, uh, idle hands are the devil's tools. So <laughs> t- tell us a little bit about, the, you know, uh, Running Wild and, and Rise and kind of the mission behind what you're doing. Sure. Um, so Running Wild, uh, the first iteration of Running Wild began because I've been in the writing and publishing world for 20 something years. And I had all these friends who were just absolutely amazing authors. And um, literally on the first date with my now husband, I was complaining about this. I said, I don't understand why they can't get published. This doesn't make any sense to me. These are brilliant stories. And he said, um, my husband's from the indie music world. And he's like, well, why don't you just start your own press? And I just looked at him cluelessly. I was like, well, what, it works that way? You can do that? <laughs> so, uh, and I'm, I'm, as you know, right, because Jonathan and, and I have known each other for like 20 years. Um, I'm one of those fools that like, if you give me a dare, I take it, you know? And uh, so to me, that was a dare. So I then went around and at the time I was uh, the head of a writer's organization and I would basically pull aside editors and uh, different publishers, like from the bigger and medium sized houses and under, got an understanding of what their process was and how they made decisions in terms of acquiring titles. And that's where I realized where the gaps were. So uh, we started Running Wild uh, to, again, change the world through story, uh, initially publishing more just like cross genre pieces. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then also my own personal pet peeve at the time, anthologies were not a big thing. And uh, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a short story anthology and a novella anthology because I don't know about you, Jonathan, but I love novellas. It's like a nice, quick, I can get like a really fulfilling story in, in like a day. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and it, but it feels like it has the meatiness of Mm -hmm. a longer form. Um, So anyway, so uh, we initiated that. And then during um, the horror of Black Lives Matter, Um, when that was going down, someone online actually called me out and said, what are you doing about it? And I thought, I don't, uh, I don't know, what am I doing? And that's when uh, I did some research on the larger houses. And I realized that, um, that there's an inherent bias uh, at at that time, there's actually a big New York Times article about uh, the publishing industry, especially the larger houses and um, how not only how stories are acquired, but also um, I think at the time it was something like 97% of the people behind the scenes at the larger houses are all self-identify as Caucasian. And it's around the same numbers of those that they have uh, identified as uh, like, you know, as authors and, and those who come on to, to create content, right? So the creative uh, side. And I realized, okay, that that's that's a big problem, especially if you look at the fact that in the United States, at least, I think it's by 2045, uh, the majority of the population is actually anticipated to be non-Caucasian. And uh, I, I get this question all the time, like, so what? What does that mean? Um, it means that there's, from a business perspective, there's a large segment of the population that's being, uh, in essence, ignored. So their experience, uh, like there are certain things that like you and I can do uh, in, in research to find out and to highlight in our stories. But there are certain things around uh, different individuals' experiences that we'll never understand, right? And they won't know to highlight it to us because, you know, why, why, why would you think about uh, an example would be um, like, I grew up in an, uh, a heavily interracial uh, or multiracial neighborhood. And my best friend, um, her father was African American, her mother was white. And when we were kids, we'd go to the mall and uh, adults would come by and they would, they would like look 
look at me and say, oh, she's so cute. And then they turn to, her name's Heather. They turn to Heather and they wouldn't look at Heather. They look at her mom and say, oh, your daughter is so adorable. And they would act like she was an object. And I did not understand what was going on. I was like, uh, so I, I would literally go back to my mom and ask, why, why are they talking directly to me like I'm an adult, but they're talking to my best friend like she's an object? And my mom was like, you know, how are you going to have an answer for that? But if you're, if you don't experience that, you don't know that others are not experiencing it. If that makes sense. Yeah, there, there's a there's a great de uh, degree of truth to to the concept of white privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that, that uh, I am more likely to get, you know, if, if I had a, 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 a black friend who was in, in the same part of 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 his career as I am, same amount of books published, so on there is more likelihood I would get uh, a book deal or more likely I would be invited as a speaker simply because because of, of skin color. And that's that's not only foolish and, and archaic and ugly thinking, it also deprives the, the, the reading public or the, you know, of these new voices. Yeah. Um, like I know I recently, you know, a couple of years ago, I took over Weird Tales magazine. And even though that, you know, that magazine is landmark in, in what it's been able to bring in terms of, of entertainment over the last century, um, the 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 writers who were published in it under most of the editorial leaderships tended to be guys like me. Mm -hmm. uh, when Ann Vandermeer uh, took it over some years ago, she did a lot to change that. When I took it over, it was my mandate to change that for a couple of reasons. And one of them is actually selfish. I know what a lot of the, the, the writers of my type are writing. And yeah. I'm writing, if I'm editing a horror magazine, I want to find out what kinds of stories are great stories from different voices, different perspectives, different experiences. I, as, as empathetic as I try to be, I'm not that. So right. the only way for me to, to grow in my understanding of, of why diversity is a beautiful thing is to listen or read or pay attention and allow um, and encourage. And those things are, um, are, you know, I know you're doing that with Rise. I do that with, with my anthologies and my uh, uh, Weird Tales. And it's not like I'm doing it because of, of cultural guilt or anything. I'm doing it because I know there are so many stories that that want to be told and can be told. And I want if I can do anything to help that along, definitely going to do it. Oh, 100 percent. And, you know, to your point, I want to use my my white privilege for good. Right. Sure. And if I see an avenue, if I see a venue, if I see a way for me to not only use my white privilege, but use my background in storytelling, use my background in finding new authors, um, use my network, use my connections to make mm -hmm. that and enable that I'm doing it. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. And I said, part of part, you know, part of it's altruistic because that's, you know, the nature of, of you know, of what we're trying to do in, in the world. And part of it is selfish because I'm, I'm being blown away by these stories. Good example. When I, when I first took over weird tales, I had a bookseller, uh, uh, Rob Crowther at Mysterious Galaxy Books in San Diego. I love knows Rob. Him. I'm always reading all over the place. And he recommended a book to me called The Bow of Black Tom by Victor Laval. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, he particularly because I I was, you know, I was taking over Weird Tales magazine. Um, he knew that I love Lovecraftian stuff, and Lovecraft himself was very problematic in his racial uh, views and so on. Mm -hmm. And he said this this author had taken that one of his most racist stories and flipped it told it from the point of view of the black character. Oh, and cool. It, brilliant. And it, it left me bruised and breathless. So when I when I was putting together my first issue of Weird Tales, first thing I did was bring Victor Laval in there. I said, I said you bruised me with that story, Battle of Black Tom. Come and draw blood for me at Weird Tales. And boy, did he. His story, Up From Slavery, you can't read that and, and be indifferent to it. Mm. You can't. Um, e even if you're not you know, a fan of that particular writer, the story is so profoundly powerful. It, it starts questions in your own mind. And I know with Rise, you're trying to do that, not just to put out good stories, but to start those conversations because change can't happen without conversation. Oh, 100%. And, you know, we've been really blessed to have the likes of uh, The Valley of Sage and Juniper by Shay Galloway. And that's coming out, uh, I believe, next month. And mm -hmm. it was already... Um, forward review already stated that um, she's reinvented.
Take a, take a moment. <laughs> She's reinvented the Western genre. And she shopped that thing everywhere. And the fact that, um, I mean, it was gorgeous when we got it. Don't get me wrong, right? Um, but the fact that something that is that profound, it's making, it's changing an entire genre. Um, and it was ignored because the all the primary, in my opinion, right? Because I don't know why it was ignored, but it had been shot down by, you know, all the big houses. And I'm hearing mm -hmm. that across the board. I, I literally got a, a text this morning from uh, a dear friend who uh, is from the Pixel Project, and uh, we published mm -hmm. their anthology. Um, it's a nonprofit. And she has a dear friend who um, is African American. He writes sci fi fantasy. He has been shopping his novels everywhere. She's like, Lisa, these things are gorgeous. They constantly get rejected. And the reason is, it's just, yeah, it's not our thing. And I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me um, that that's, that's, I mean, change that. Based on the acquisition models that exist today, I understand. But based on um, putting out great stories that really represent, you know, um, our populace, it doesn't make any sense. So. Yeah, and, and the acquisition models often reflect who has been buying. But it's Correct. a somewhat limited thinking approach because it excludes the possibility of growing the market by people who will be drawn to it because of diverse voices and diverse experiences that add la layers of richness and originality to something that you wouldn't otherwise get. Not that you know I'm, I'm slamming any any you know even, even my own demographic as as having played itself out. It's not right. writing is endlessly malleable and endlessly. Uh, it's an endlessly rich um, uh, pool to, to, to dip from. But if we're only publishing one model, because that's the safe one, because that's the one we're experienced with, um, we're shortchanging everybody who's involved in that project um, by denying them the opportunity to, to find other types of stories. I've read stories that have creeped me out. And, you know, I've, I've been reading horror for a very long time and fan dark fantasy. And, um, after a while, you get to kind of know what to expect from certain when a story starts in a certain way. You get some voices out there telling stories where you have no idea where it's going to go, but the ride is going to be amazing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because I think a lot of these um, acquisition models are really antiquated. They're based on, you know, how things were, gosh, what, 50, 100 years ago. And when we look at how uh, readers, or not even readers, how fans are uh, and consuming their favorite stories, they're going everywhere, right? They don't just want, and I'm going to use a, a, a pertinent example, I believe, like V Wars. They don't just want V Wars in a comic or graphic novel form. They want V Wars on the big screen. They want it on their TV. They want it in a game, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's true of all their favorite stories. So to use an acquisition model that by default, you're already isolating a very large popula uh, part of po the population just because, well, this is how it's always been. Well, that's just bad business. Yeah, and, and one of the things <clears throat> that's fun about presses like, like Running Wild, you know, it's, it, you're a small press. It's a growing press, but still a small press. And that, that size allows you to pivot more easily in the direction of positive change. I mean, we've we've seen, you know, I've, I've been a novelist since 2006. Mm -hmm. I have seen the not only the publishing landscape change, but the publishing technology change. Mm -hmm. uh, digital publishing and so many freelance uh, editors, agents, and so on that are out there have allowed uh, indie and small press pu publishing to uh, be as finely uh, crafted as anything from the big houses to the point that they become indistinguishable, a good book. It's a good book and a good book well presented. And uh, how, how have you uh, navigated as these changes have come about? Honestly, we've been really blessed in that um, we've had, uh, in, in ter like in terms of our acquisition, like we've been blessed to have some amazing editors. Anyone who's applied to us to be an editor has to go through a test. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people are sitting there going, oh, God, really? Like, come on. Someone knows their shit. Shouldn't you just like let them let them do it? But anyway, um, we've also so I actually have a background in technology as well as um, editing. So a lot of the what's enabled us to pivot really well is the fact that we're, we're using pre-existing technology that uh, can connect to other technologies. So for those within the um the tech world, we use a lot of SaaSes, we use a lot of cloud-based uh, solutions. What we've also been able to do is um, we are really, really honored to have actually the likes of Jonathan um, as one of our advisors. So when we're getting ready to make some you know, change or there's something that we're you know, questioning, uh, reach out. we reach out to our advisory board and ask, hey, this is what we're looking to do. Do you have any guidance? And we have been really, really lucky to have like the likes of Chris Royal, who was from IDW Publishing, mm -hmm. and Brett Cohen, who was from Quirk Books, and uh, individuals who uh, were originally with Warner Brothers and Warner Media, who uh, can use their experiences and experiences of others within those uh, their entities to come forward and say, "All right, look out for this. Like we made this mistake." be aware, you know, do this, uh, this is how you vet something, you know, that kind of thing. And I mean, that feedback is absolutely invaluable and it really helps us make smart pivots instead of going down like a rabbit hole, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. And, um, one of the things that, you know, it, a lot of people don't realize that those of us in traditional publishing, I'm, I'm, I'm completely in the traditional publishing world, but those of us in traditional publishing have a huge, huge interest in, uh, medium, small press, and indie publishing, because anything that gets books into the hands of readers expands the base of readers. Correct. So, you know, yes, and also, quite frankly, it's more fun when there are more kids in the playground. So, you know, if you if you think that writing, or if you've been told that writing and publishing are competitive, that's not really true. Um, what 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 we're we're competing with is trying to get the best stories out of the best writers of those types of stories, no matter what you know, where they come from and help cultivate not only the writer, but the career. And that kind of takes us back a little bit to how you and I met. Um, you were running a writer's conference and brought me in as a speaker when, before I was a novelist, 20, I don't know how many years ago that was, 21 or two years ago. I was yeah. writing magazine features at the time. Um, it was the very first writer's conference I'd ever been to as a speaker. And it was also one that encouraged um, the conferees and the faculty to mix and, and network together. And that allowed me to get more of, an, of a view of what the writing world is like. And it helped stoke my interest in, in becoming a novelist, which has worked out pretty well for me. Oh, um, wow. Very So, yeah, that was fun. I was why you picked me, by the way. <laughs> uh, so you were a fan favorite because you were already speaking, but around uh, journalism, uh, like how to write a, a how to write a, an article mm -hmm. uh, at other conferences. And when your name came up, because we'd like to do a blend of like, at the time, actually, I believe they still have this model, really big names, and then a local who's like a, a, a local favorite, like a local author. And I had actually attended one of your workshops at, I think it was the Philadelphia Writers Conference. No. And um, you were talking about how to write an article. Yeah, go ahead. And I was just, I, you were talking about how to write an article. And um, I remember, and, and I, I, so I owned it. I owned up to this. I, uh, I was sitting there and I was bored. But the reason I was bored is because my father was a radio personality and a journalist. So I, like everything you were talking about, like I knew, but it, you know, I, I just figured I'll come in and learn something new. Right. So uh, originally when your name came up, I was like, OK, like, tell me, like, tell me why. And they were like, oh, my gosh, like he's uh, an amazing uh, journalist. And, um, you know, he's very pro writer. He's very much about the community. You know, he he's all about finding new people and like everybody elevating one another. And I was like, OK, well, then he's perfect for our conference. And that that's. That, honestly, that's what brought you in. So. Well, that's flattering. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
and and that you know that whole thing about writers helping other writers and supporting the communities has been a big part of my career. Mm -hmm. um, actually, before I had a career, when I was a kid, I, I got to know and be mentored by Ray Bradbury and Richard Matheson. Long story, won't tell here, but um, one of the things that that Bradbury mentioned uh, was the difference of the two different writing camps. Mm -hmm. So there's one camp in the writing world where they seem to think that if you give advice or or a tip or something that helps the you know the other guy that they're going to get your slot because right. opportunities are finite. And Bradbury said that's fear-based. And, you know, if fear plays any part of your business model, you're doing it wrong. The other uh, model, he said, is one where if a writer asks you to help, you help. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, the more, the more good books that are, that are the more good writers that are out there, more good books that will be written, all of publishing will, will rise. And, you know, he told me that when I was like 12 or 13. And it's... Wow. And um, when I started the, when I was at the writer's room in Doylestown, uh, uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania, one of the things that we did was start a, a, a regular um, networking session for writers. We called it the Writer's Coffee House. And they, there's still <laughs> Writer's Coffee Houses now in, in bookstores around the country. And, um, you know, it's, it's not anybody making a buck off it. It's writers helping writers. And because we really hate to see them run into closed doors, tri you know, trip over speed, speed bumps. If we can give a bit of advice, then we, we can help have it's party time when, when they make their 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 their, their next step in advancement. And it should be a joyful thing, not a fearful thing. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, it's funny. Um, I with that with like that kind of mindset, I actually reached out to, oh, gosh, I want to say 30 or 40 small presses and mm -hmm. said, hey, why don't we just get together and chat? And only two responded to me. One, uh, I knew the guys, we all went to the same, uh, graduate program. So we were old friends and the other, uh, I, we talked once and I have a feeling she was given feedback, like, don't do that again, because we were like, yeah, we'll do this monthly and man disappeared off the face of the planet. So a hundred percent, there's a lot of fear that goes, I mean, across the board, right? Yeah. And so much of this is it's it's all about elevating each other, right? And yeah, it uh, it's weird to me. And, and and celebrating each other because I mean there is my personal opinion nothing nothing more delightful than being able to conjure a story, craft it in the best possible way, and share it with people in ways that in, you know entertain and enrich. And mm -hmm. you know there's no part of that that doesn't sound like the best job in the world, you know. We're professional daydreamers, you know, but also we can enable that uh, that behavior, too. And one of the things uh, that I actually want to talk about here is how how writers can um, can establish kind of a platform, a name, mm -hmm. how, how build their career. What, what are some of your tips on that? I mean, it's honestly it's first figuring out, like, who do you want to be when you grow up? And I know that sounds trite. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, God, everyone says something like that. Uh, but it's true, right? Because so much of this, like Jonathan, you made a decision early on, like you were like, you know what, I want to focus on horror, right? This is a passion of mine. Uh, I'm very more pop culture focused. So this is where I'm going to focus my path, right? Mm -hmm. And and so then you made very, uh, in my opinion, like calculated decisions, like I, I'll, I'll write this kind of book and I'll focus here. And in terms of getting an agent, you were very clear on what uh, type of agent you wanted and needed and what magazines you would submit to uh, and, and so on. Right. And in reality, I mean, I know we've both been like, ah, oh, it's so fabulous. You, you know, you get to uh, great storytelling and, you know, really bring joy to people and, and, you know, really engage them in these amazing stories, but it's also a business. And so figuring out the, okay, who am I? Like, who do I want to be? And once you identify that, like, who do I want to be when I grow up? And let's say you decide that you want to be a fantasy writer, then you focus on studying th that work. But yeah. then you also focus like where you're going to talk, right? Uh, the conferences you're going to go to, how you're going to present yourself in social media, um, you know, who you want to speak to in terms of your network, right? And all that, believe it or not, I mean, I know you, you know this, it feeds the how to, how building that brand because that's be, that's what you become known for 
if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Building the brand is really important, too. And a lot of folks don't realize realize that when they go into it. Um, you know, we're in politically divisive times and some people will, will use their social media to argue politics. And if you're going to be a writer, that's that's the wrong note, because that excludes half the possible readership. And also, it, you know, unless that's the reason you're on social media, that shouldn't be the reason uh, what you're doing on social media. Right. Social media should be there if you're a writer to support your career and your involvement within the community of writers. Uh, I, I made the mistake of doing politics, you know, early on, and it did me no good. It got me into arguments and, it, and unwinnable stuff and no value. You know, there's no value personally or professionally in it. Um, what I prefer is starting conversations that, that cause actual community engagement. Like, you know, I often post to ask people to tell me what their current work in progress is mm. or what the latest success is or something along those lines so that we're all sharing in each other's progress and each other's successes. Mm -hmm. Even if that bit of progress is, hey, I wrote my the first page of my first story today. That's a reason to celebrate. You know, mm -hmm. wow, that's so cool. Um, it, it's one of those things that, that you know, you, you, you can't ever have that first again, you know. Um, having people do cover reveals or uh, mm -hmm. share reviews by uh, for, of other people's books. And it, with social media, a lot of writers breaking in don't don't realize that um, your social media presence should not be there as a, as a book stall. You're not there to sell books. You're there to become part of the communi uh, community of people who love writing, love reading, mm -hmm. love everything about the book world. So it, me just telling an audience about what I'm doing is going to chase people away. And I'm not going to get deep, rich conversations. Uh, I'm going to come off as shallow, and I prefer not to to be, you know, viewed as shallow. And also I lose out by not becoming part of a community, you know, mm -hmm. and get into the community. So now, yeah, please. I'm just going to ask, like, how did you, uh, cause you know, you and I've had similar conversations before. What were your initial steps in terms of developing the brand of Jonathan? Like what, what did you do? Uh, well, let me tell you about what I did wrong first. <laughs> first <laughs> I, got a, I got a website with the title of my first book as my website. And then I realized that that's silly because the book is a byproduct of the brand and we are the brand. Mm -hmm. So I had to rebrand myself and that took a little bit of time. Um, and mind you, this was back in the MySpace and Friendster days. Wow. Back when dinosaurs ruled the earth. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to have conversations with, with writers. And since going from the magazine world to the fiction world, I didn't know any of the key players in fiction. I didn't know the writers. I didn't know the reviewers, the bloggers, you know, the, the people in the industry or, or the fans that were dedicated to certain things. So I started within my genre and mm -hmm. I started in horror. I've moved into other areas, you know, uh, since, but I started friending my, the writers whose works I most admired and, and, you know, commenting on their work and, and, and getting to know them and getting to know their, their, the top fans, the ones who are posting all the time, because mm -hmm. if they're a fan, I'm a fan, we have something in common. Mm -hmm. uh, building out from there, uh, friending bookstores, librarians, um, booksellers, you know, like the, the trade salespeople at my publishing house, you know, so that they are valued for the work they do because they never get a pat on the back. You know, the team that puts together a novel that comes out is actually pretty huge and you never hear about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, we authors will probably thank our editor and agent in the in the in, uh, acknowledgments, but it's really a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, when you're putting up a review, when somebody's putting up a like an Amazon review or something, it matters less to the author. It mm -hmm. matters a whole lot to the the unsung team behind the the, uh, uh, the book, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, because they're the ones who never get the pat on the back. So I wanted to include that and become part of that whole process to get to know everyone at every level. So first of all, it helped me understand the publishing. And, and we, we both know that it's important for the people working with us to understand what publishing is. Oh, yeah. It, it, you're making friends with people who are often ignored. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it amazes me. Like even my audiobook reader, Ray Porter, he had, before I contacted him, he had never once been contacted by any writer who, whose works he'd read. Mm -hmm. Same to me. Mm -hmm. That's our community. Oh yeah. And it's funny. We, uh, our, uh, cover designer, um, he has his own business pulp studios and 
I'm always, uh, I always get comments on how fabulous, how amazing these uh, covers are. And, um, you know, so I'll go out of my way to, to, to mention like, you know, who created this cover and I'm, I'm just surprised how, how few of those individuals who, I mean, they're really kind of like the glue, yeah. the entire story, you know, like they bring everything together and uh, they, to your point, they're just not really, uh, given the acclaim that they should receive. So, yeah. and also, uh, writers should be talking about their, their bookstores, their favorite bookstores. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, my favorite is, is currently is mysterious galaxy because it's my neighborhood bookstore. Mm. When I talk about books online, I, you know, I encourage people to get them anywhere they can, but mm -hmm. if they want to find books, contact my local bookstore, they'll contact me and let me know to come in and sign those books. Mm -hmm. Well, that creates a relationship where, yeah, yes, I'm selling books, but I'm selling books in a way that supports my local brick and mortar indie bookstore. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big thing. That's, and I get involved in community events at the bookstore. Mm -hmm. So it's community, community, community. Uh, yeah. Social media isn't, isn't an advertising platform. It's a social platform if used correctly. And it's great for building a career. Oh yeah. And it's, uh, to your point, there's so much benefit in just simply reaching out to your local booksellers and even your local library and mm -hmm. saying, Hey, you know, I've got this book coming out or I'm a part of this anthology or this collection. I would love to set up a, an event with you guys. Right. And just spread the word. And um, actually, if you're if you're a fan of, of, of a specific author, there's value in reaching out to those locations as well and just saying, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm a huge Jonathan Mayberry fan. Um, I hear he's got something coming out soon. What is there any way you guys could get him to come out? Because I think a lot of booksellers, they'll respond to that. They'll find a way to make it happen. So, you know, don't discount your if you're a reader, don't discount the, the value that you bring. Yeah, and also, you know, if um, all writers should be readers, um, there yeah. are a few who are not, which always freaks me out a little bit. Like, how? And you had mentioned earlier, if you're writing in a certain zone, you should read that zone. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, celebrate that. One of the things that a, a new writer can do when they have their first work at is, you know, have a little sheet of paper with maybe six or ten other titles by other, other authors that are in the same zone. Because right. readers often read in a zone. Well, if you like this book, here are some other uh, readers, uh, other writers you might dig. Mm -hmm. And that becomes then, a, it doesn't matter if they're the same publishing house or not. It's books that they might enjoy. And very often I've noticed that this has led to impulse buys from those people at a book signing to grab another book, one of the books off the list before mm -hmm. they check out of the store too. Um, and that's a lot of fun too. And there's so many ways in which the writer can become involved in the community. And mm -hmm. that builds brand because then you're seen as part of both the community of writers mm -hmm. and the community of readers. And, oh, yeah. You know, we want our readers to feel like they're included in all this. Well, and uh, it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I growing up went through periods like there was a, a period when I pretty much only read horror and then I only read erotica. Yes, I know that's random. And then I only read, <laughs> you know, like I pretty much deep dove into literary. And then I was like all about, you know, YA or whatever. Um, but what that did is it, it enabled me to then be able to understand because those genres actually, they have an overarching brand, I guess you could say. So by, to your point, by reading within those genres and becoming familiar with it, then you kind of get a feel for what people are, are looking for. So you can better represent yourself within that. Because like, I couldn't imagine a romance author coming forward with like a horror type of theme for their next book because everyone would just be confused like why is there a skeleton in this how did the alien from aliens suddenly show up on the cover of this romance book it doesn't make any sense so yeah, oh yeah and yet, yeah and yet there are you know multi-genre careers god knows i've i've jumped all over but what as a writer uh, one of the uh, there's a part of that that also enchants the reader part of me. Like uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, my editor uh, of my Joe Ledger Thrower series at, at St. Martin's Griffin asked me if I might want to take a swing at writing epic fantasy, mm. which, you know, I, I had read a lot as a teenager, um, but I had never written. And I, I said yes, because it sounded too cool not to. But the first thing I did is I read a lot of epic fantasy, rereading some old stuff that I loved. But finding out where that's gone since, mm -hmm. you know, new writer 
authors, you know, well, new to me, like Robin Hobb and Patrick Rothfuss and, and so on. I hadn't read their books up until then. And then I found out that epic fantasy, uh, high fantasy, swords and sorcery fantasy, had evolved with all these new voices and new styles. It wasn't just Conan and Tolkien. You know, there, yeah. there was all these other things out there. And it made the experience of wanting to write those books so much richer as a writer, but also gave me, it's like finding a treasure trove as a reader. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that sort of thing is, is, is just gold. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. And uh, to take it back a little bit, um, you know, you'd mentioned about your favorite bookseller. And uh, to kind of piggyback on that, like, I love Mysterious Galaxy as well, in part because I love Rob and Nick. I mean, like, these guys, yeah. they're, they're working at the bookstore because they're nerds. They're book nerds. They love a great story. And part of my, I go out of my way to make sure that I say hi to them when I get there and find out like, so what are you reading and, and what do you think super right. cool? Right. And then that way it expands my, I always leave with like a stack, like of books. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great way to find out like what's going on in the industry and, uh, you know, find new storytellers. So, so when, you know, if we have, um, readers out you know there, there are a lot of readers uh, watch these uh these events um how does a uh, how does a reader break into reading in a new genre like what, what what are some keys for them to find out what what might be the sorts of things they want to read I, I think um you and i have touched on this a little bit but um definitely go out to your local booksellers ask right uh what great stories they found in you know the genres that either you're interested in reading more of or mm -hmm. that you want to experience um i'd say go online and uh, look for reviews to see like you know what stories have you never heard of before that you want to you want to experience the flip side of that too is you know leaving reviews to make sure that uh people can find these great stories that you found mm -hmm. and find out why you love them um Actually, and actually, you touched on this too. Um, if you're an author, make sure you comment. Uh, you you bring forward stories that you've read recently, and let the world know that you thought this was rocking. So, what about what do you think? Um, well, I I'm a big one for actually for asking booksellers. Like, you know, I I I want to read, you know, two or three books in this genre, but I don't know where to start. What's mm -hmm. safe? what's really highly reviewed and what's dangerous you know, like mm. dangerous, it's, it's, it's model it's um the genre breaking or something mm. and i did that with with rob actually at, at mysterious galaxy when mm -hmm. i was trying to write fiction and he aside from the, the different things he gave me he re made a recommendation for uh, a writer who i'd heard of but never read and for some reason i i didn't think i would like it probably maybe it was the cover art i don't know but he said, read it. And I, re I read it. It was Joe Abercrombie's The First Law. I oh. was hooked from page one. It was brilliant. And now I found a new favorite writer who's still cranking out stuff who I might never have read because of some stupid knee-jerk reaction to a cover or cover text or something. Mm -hmm. But if you ask a bookseller, especially at indie bookstores, they don't just know where it's shelved. They know what's what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I go online and I ask people for recommendations. You know, I use my social media for recommendations. I don't know how many books, probably at least half of the books I've read over the last 10 years mm -hmm. are books recommended to me in discussions on social media. Like mm -hmm. I want to read a, a book on this topic. It hit me with some suggestions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that also starts a great conversation because everybody will have a suggestion, even if it's a little outside the norm of the question. Mm -hmm. and that sometimes leads for thing leads to things. All right, well, that's a subgenre. Let me go follow that down. And mm -hmm. yes, if down the rabbit hole. So what? You know, there's a lot of books down there. Oh yeah, there's a ton. I mean, that are it's just so fun to find a new author, and uh, and then like follow them. And and honestly, in especially in today's social media world, it's so fun to find a new book like you just described, and then start following that author on like Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and tell the author how much you're enjoying the book. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. they, a lot of authors do actually read their own social, read what's on their social media uh, feed. Oh, yeah. um, and a lot, I get, yeah, I know some people have assistants to do all that and I have an assistant, but I don't you know. She doesn't do that for me. Mm -hmm. I want to know what people are saying. 
Mm -hmm. um, and now we're going to cycle back to anthologies again, because not only is it great for readers to find new writers, and I'll start on that, um, but it's also great for writers to, to break in. And mm -hmm. you, know, you publish anthologies. I love the anthologies you do. One of the, the, the fun things about that is I get to discover writers I don't know. Mm -hmm. So even if the anthology has a theme or even if it's unthemed, um, I may go in there for a name I recognize because mm -hmm. that, you know, that's often the hook to me or the theme of the anthology, which is a hook. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'll, I'll read a couple stories by the people I know, and I, I might read those first. But then I start looking at uh, reading the other things and I'm like, holy crap. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many new voices out there that are telling compelling stories. And I almost feel silly for having missed them somehow. Mm -hmm. But with, with Running Wild, you're bringing a lot of new voices in to tell stories through anthology. So you know, talk about that a little bit. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, we actually typically will try and find a better known voice like yourself to and see if they'd be willing for us to publish a short story or, you know, their novella. And um, I admit it, it's not really a bait and switch, but it's a way <laughs> to get uh, people engaged because they'll pick it up for you. And then, you know, hopefully continue reading sure. to experience the new voices. Um, and we, ours are all unthemed so far. Uh, well, no, we had one themed recently, um, which was actually a series of essays. And uh, it was, we put it out on Valentine's, this, this past Valentine's Day. And of course, that means right now my brain's going to go Pshew! for the title of it, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean... And it also, what's interesting from a writer's perspective, especially one that's like they're, they've been working it for a while, they've been trying to get their name out there. Um, it Getting that one short story or that one novella published, it can just change their entire trajectory. Even oh, sure. if, yeah, like their confidence is like, Phew, you know. Well, I mean, figure, uh, I've edited 23 anthologies so far. And, you know, yes, I put marquee names on the, on the cover and so on. But sometimes the, uh, a story that is every bit as compelling as a marquee name story will be from someone who I took a risk on publishing. You mm -hmm. know, who I just thought, well, this person just has a, has a perspective that I, I don't yet get, but I want to learn it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as a reader of anthologies, I mean, we editors read a lot of anthologies because we're on the prowl for these voices too. And oh, yeah. it's a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You know, I, I would have tried to do that in my uh, uh, Tom Hanks uh, uh, Gump voice, but it didn't, I wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but, um, it, it's so much fun to read these, you know, to go through uh, the anthologies that, that Running Wild puts out. We're going to be doing one together, at least one together. The uh, We're toying with the idea of doing a literary magic realism anthology. Um, yeah. And that's going to be a hoot because even though I'm a genre fiction writer, I read everything, everything. Yeah. And I have, I have some friends in literary fiction who are just amazing. So we're going to grab them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for writers. It's a great open door. Oh um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I've been scouted by editors because they saw my stories in early anthologies where I was not a marquee name. Hmm. And, um, you know, you grow a career that way. You also get on the radar of editors and, and readers. You know, there's no there's no downside to that to participation. Sure. Well, and uh, honestly, a lot of the authors that we've published who've gone on to win like awards and their books been named best of the year. It's because we originally published their short story or novella and they just really loved the experience of working yeah. with us. And, yeah. and they came back and said, hey, I've got these as well. You know, would you would you be interested? So. Now we we only have like a, a minute and a half left. So how how if somebody's interested in getting involved in one of your anthologies, how would they, how would they go about it? Uh, if uh, someone wants to submit a great story, uh, go ahead and send it to us on submittable.com. Just search off of uh, on Running Wild, and you will find our submissions. If you want to just find out more about our catalogs, uh, our web address is runningwildpress.com. Will you be doing? Will, will Rise be doing any anthologies? Oh, yeah. I actually am currently editing uh, the next Rise novella anthology. Uh, we are, we're we're going to have an annual short story and novella anthology for Rise. Oh, that's fantastic. And those submission guidelines are on, on the website as well? Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so to, to wrap up, any, any final notes for uh, either readers or writers who want to explore new voices and expand their, their, uh, um, their sense of wonder? 
man, nerd out, right? Just go out and, and, and ask, talk, you know, talk to your booksellers, talk, actually talk, uh, tweet your favorite authors and say, who are you reading? Yeah. And just have a blast. Yeah, that's great. And I just, I was at a, a writer's, con a, a pop culture conference just, uh, recently. And one of the, the conversations, one of the common conversational topics is they would ask me, um, or that I would ask them what they're reading other than my own stuff. And they're asking me the same question mm -hmm. and we wrote it out and, you know, nerds rule. So, all right. Well, <laughs> very fast and very fun conversation, Lisa. Thank you. And, uh, um, we're, uh, you know, again, this is uh, book fest spring 2023. And, uh, we hope you guys follow along with us and, uh, enjoy the, um, uh, all the conversations that'll be coming up and panels that are coming up. And again, thank you. Go read.